My name is Ben Johnson. I'll get to my background in a second. Uh, I think Rob kind of covered it. I am on Pacific time. This is my first conference wearing glasses. I have 47 slides and I got in at 1 a.m. So let's see how this goes. Uh, but I'm really excited to be here, Threat Hunting uh, Incident Response Summit. The challenge is, what do I talk about? We have a whole slew of great technical talks, deep dives, vendors. The keynote's meant to be a little bit more high level, which is good, because then I can just say stuff that's neither right nor wrong, and you can figure it out later. So let's just dive in. <clears throat> and thanks to Sam for putting up with my late, uh, late slide submission and, and all that. They can you know, kick me later. So agenda, real simple. State of cyber, I'll give you a spoiler. It's not great. And then maybe we can <clears throat> look a little bit into entrepreneurship. Are there some lessons we can take from entrepreneurship and apply that to our efforts to hunt? And then we'll wrap up. My general approach to presentations is to throw as much at you as I can and just hope a couple things stick. You can take all the pictures you want. I will happily give you all these slides so you don't have to take any pictures if you don't want to. <clears throat> so as Rob mentioned, got my start in the Intel community, NSA, went to Mantech, worked with Rob, Phil, uh, Henry, I think I see Mark, yep, a bunch of other people, Intrusion Operations Division, it was unbelievable. Uh, stuff I would have done for free, I think we all, all would have done for free and we got paid for it. So, so there you go. Uh, ultimately ended up leaving government world, did a couple years in finance actually, uh, went back, helped found Carbon Black, helped write the first version, and then ended up jumping on planes for several years to talk to people like yourselves. Spoke to 600 organizations, and my goal, <clears throat> excuse me, was quite simply to absorb, learn, and then hopefully I can contribute something back to the discussion. And then I got the startup again, so I moved to Southern California, uh, started Obsidian, we're about 35 people. Last year we were about five, so it's been kind of a wild year. And being in Southern California, you'll see lots of slides with beaches and stuff, just so I can rub it in a little bit. But if anyone wants to come visit, please come visit. Uh, speaking about entrepreneurship, I really love the startup journey. So I'm on all other boards, different stages, different types of companies. And I taught entrepreneurship at University of Chicago to the Master's in Computer Science program. So that's where some of this stuff comes from. So today's goal, and I always throw this slide in there. You'll see, if you've seen <clears throat> me present before, you'll see a few slides that Maybe you've seen multiple times, reuse, right? Why not? Uh, but my goal for a presentation is always just to get you to think. I just want you to contemplate. Hopefully the alerts are shut off, the phone's on airplane mode, don't have meetings, you just hear all in one room, absorb, think, contemplate. And hopefully you walk away with something. Uh, another reason my uh, being up here is a little crazy is I'm in the middle of a physical world incident response where I have in my Chicago house that refused to leave. And I've been talking to all of these, yes, including SWAT team. Uh, over the last week, I was in Chicago till last night. <clears throat> trying, they're, all their stuff's still there. They finally left, but their stuff is still there, and they have a ton of stuff. So yeah, it's kind of like <clears throat> cyber incident response, right? There's all these different groups, not necessarily having the same information, different incentives. Some move fast, some move incredibly slow. Uh, but anyways, enough about that. Just, just thought that was interesting. The state of cyber. You're probably all sick of the headlines. Breach fatigue, headline fatigue. We in this room care. That's why you're here. But to be honest, I don't even update this slide because you don't really care what the, the headlines are. The point is it's not pretty. And what's maybe a little bit sobering is we're not getting better. Now, we're becoming more and more connected, more digital. So just in pure quantity, there's going to be more breaches. But it's just exploding. And even the cloud, which I truly believe is an opportunity for us to be way more secure, is leaky, is causing more problems. This is also probably outdated by now, but there's just a lot of leaks. Whether it's compromised, whether it's an open S3 bucket, it's too easy to to leak data. And a variety of adversaries. And what would a talk be without a Threatscape slide? So you get criminals, hacktivists, nation states, insiders. You get financial crimes usually, maybe making a statement, 
espionage, maybe election interference, uh, other aspects of nation states and insiders. But the only reason I put this slide up here is the insiders. People forget about insiders. And I'm not talking about the person sitting next to you. They might be an insider, sure. But I'm talking about their access. Because what are the first three after? The first thing they're after is access. Then they try to focus on their objectives. They need that maintained persistent access. And a lot of times that's through employee access, credential access, blending in. So I want us to keep that in mind. And there's many challenges. So to me, there's no debate that there's a skills gap. The reasons for the skills gap, maybe people have different opinions, HR has bad job descriptions, or the pool is too small, whatever it is, there's not enough qualified butts and seats. Then you set up your tech stack, your security stack, and you have deploy and decay. It gets worse over time. You don't have enough people giving it the care and feeding, sort of brushing its teeth all the time. So environments change, adversaries change. Maybe your detection rules, prevention rules, your configs stay the same. You're going to get decay. Then attackers, bad guys, whomever, they're having success. So they get encouraged to do more. Or their friends, like any market, it drives competition. They dive in. And then finally, huge data. I don't even know if that's a real term, but it's so easy. You click a button, you copy terabytes of information to the cloud. Everything's syncing all over the place. Every copy of data is a liability. And we're copying it all over the place. So essentially, the summation of that is this lack of cyber self-esteem. Now, people in this room actually probably have the most cyber self-esteem. You actually think you can make a difference, and I love that. I think we can too. But when you travel the world, you talk to lots of organizations, whether it's the CISO having little faith in their team, whether it's the team having little faith in the executives or the culture or whatever, it's tough. We need Mr. Rogers to come out and give us an after-school special. So, hunting. Rob was just talking about what's the definition of hunting. To me, it's pretty simple. And I'm not saying this is the end-all, be-all definition. You can detect all of the things. Tools don't. So there's a gap. There's a gap where we need human minds, critical thought, human time, manual effort. To me, that's hunting, finding the stuff that lives in that gap. And ideally, we all have the equivalent of the predator drone. We fly it to the target, take the business. But reality is never ideal. We might not even have a weapon. We might not even have time to hunt. And in fact, that's a lot of this talk is just trying to do maybe a little bit, even if you don't have much. So can hunting be formulaic? Can we come up with a formula? Do we just you know, add X headcount, throw some tools in there, get some buy-in, and you're done? No, there's no formula. Sure, maybe you can find the Rambo or the Wonder Woman or that sort of badass technical hunter. Cool. Those are not scalable, and they're hard to find. They're probably mostly in this room. There's not many of them in the world. So entrepreneurship, sort of setting the stage, entrepreneurship. Who here thinks they're an entrepreneur? Come on, I gotta get a couple hands. Few, come on. All right, we'll come back to that. So what's the formula for startups? Do you just have an idea, throw some work at it, maybe raise some money and you're done, you profit? It's incredibly hard, incredibly hard. There's no formula. But maybe we can start thinking about how startups have a little bit more guidance. So Toyota, in the 70s or 80s, invented something called lean manufacturing. And some people even think it was in the 30s. Quite simply, they said, we're going to reduce waste, eliminate waste. And what is waste? Waste is anything that doesn't directly contribute to value for the customer. And there's lots of ways you might have waste. You might ship things in an inefficient route. You might have workers on a factory floor taking too many steps. You might do too many quality control checks. It doesn't really matter for this purpose, but what matters is there's a lot of waste. And we all have waste. 
We all do things that don't ultimately add value at the end. And so thinking about that, thinking about reducing waste and focus, I just want to throw out there one of my favorite books, and actually have a book section at the end because if you take nothing else away other than a book recommendation, I think it's still a successful day. Essentialism is about finding your greatest point of contribution. Basically, what's the biggest ROI of your time? And I've done lots of presentations on this kind of topic because we all have the same amount of time, 86,000 and change seconds per day. How do we spend it? How do you get the biggest ROI? And we talk about threat hunting and incident response. How are you getting the biggest bang for your buck? And so these kinds of ideas led to something called the Lean Startup Methodology. And a lot of you have probably heard some of this before. Maybe you know it way better than me. That's OK. But Lean Startup is about how can you get your product and service into the hands of customers faster? And how do you reduce uncertainty? Know that you're building the right thing. Only like four people raised their hands when I asked where entrepreneurs were. Entrepreneurs everywhere. It's a mindset. Even if you work for a big company, you can be an entrepreneur. And sometimes they call us intrapreneurs. But it's just about identifying the problem and trying to solve it, trying to build something to solve it. It doesn't mean you have to go raise money or something like that. But a lot of it is you got to think big. You got to think about solving something worthwhile. But then you start small. You take that first step. And then ideally move fast, scale fast. And I love quotes. You'll see quotes throughout my whole talk. The day before something's a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea. And so hopefully in your heads, and we'll start to tie this a little bit more directly to hunting, but hopefully in your heads you can see where some of this stuff's going in terms of things like hunting, incident response, security in general. Another topic in, another principle in lean startup methodology is validated learning. Basically, how fast can you learn? There's another question you might ask, which is when you raise 5 million bucks, 10 million bucks, what did you learn from spending that money? It's not just about product output or whatever. It's about learning as a company, as a team, as a business, whatever. And same here. How quickly can you learn? Create a hypothesis, run an experiment, analyze the results, repeat. To me, that sounds a lot like hunting. And uh, you know, all I do is basically work, family, and then read books. <laughs> Um, or watch TED Talks and stuff. Reading a book right now called Rocket Men, amazing book, I haven't finished it yet. Um, but they had this quote, they said, are you learning in gulps or sips? It's a very simple way to remember it. Are you learning in gulps or sips? In your work, are you learning in gulps or sips? During incident response, are you learning in gulps or sips? So a big part of lean startup methodology is how fast can you learn, is this the right thing? The right feature, the right product, the right color, the right price? And so what Lean Startup methodology did was then create a cycle, because everyone likes cycles. And it's really simple to remember. Build, measure, learn. Build something, go deploy it, run it, use it, whatever, but you have to be able to measure it, then learn from it. If you can't measure it, you can't optimize it. So you go through this cycle, and this is very common, in startup, and this is really what agile software development and agile methodology tries to follow, which is very iterative. Can I do something every sprint or every, every day even that improves things? And if we're talking about loops, OODA loops. You probably have OODA loop fatigue if you come to a lot of these, but the whole point is, in the US Air Force, they came out with something called the OODA loop, which is in military dogfighting, whoever can observe orient, decide, and act the fastest as a pilot will win. Can you observe your environment, orient yourself to the environment, decide, and then act? Go through that loop. And I have to say, decide is tough sometimes. You've got to be comfortable making decisions, just as like a tip, right? The thing I still have to do all the time is make decisions, and sometimes very quickly without information. MVP, minimum viable product. Part of entrepreneurship, part of lean startup. This is what they're trying to 
get across what we're trying to talk about, which is what's the smallest thing you can build that adds value? Get that out there. Get that in the hands of people and see if it's working, see if it's valuable. So start to think about what MVP you think is maybe necessary. So maybe slightly, slightly more interesting. I hope I'm keeping everyone awake. I know it's early. So talking about applied lean hunting. And I call it just hunting because I think we should be hunting more than threats. We hunt risk. And a risk is an overloaded term, but aspects of your environment that contribute to a higher likelihood of compromise. So sitting here, can you all think about what can I build to start helping hunting in my environment? Maybe you have a great hunting program. I'm sure it can be better. Maybe you have zero. What can you do to start? So what is your pain point? When you sit down and you say, you know what, I want to hunt, what is your pain point? And start to think about what would you build as a product? Service, piece of information, whatever it is. Who is this for? What is this for? And there's a pretty common uh, example, which is, are you building a painkiller or a vitamin? I like vitamins, but they're not that necessary. When you need a painkiller, you need a painkiller, and you will pay for it. And Einstein said this, or at least people think he did, that's up for debate, like most things. If I had to spend an hour solving a problem, I'd spend the first 55 minutes thinking about the problem. Do you understand your pain points when it comes to hunting? What's truly preventing you from doing more hunting or doing better hunting? Can you think about that? So, when you think about hunting, or at least when I think about hunting, you're kind of choosing left or right. And then you need to figure out, did you make the right choice or not? But if you made the wrong choice, you need to figure that out very quickly. We all pull those threads during analysis, during investigation, and go down a rat hole and lose days, weeks, whatever, and find nothing or learn very little. So can you very quickly fail and realize, hey, I went down the wrong path? Let me course correct, pivot, go the other direction. And you kind of do that over and over again until you get to what you're looking for. So how quickly can you do that and can you learn from that? Can you start to realize, why did you make that decision? Was it just sort of gut, flip a coin, whatever? Why'd you run this query? Why'd you decide to look over here? Can you start to understand maybe a little bit more data or science behind that? So that next time you get better and better and better and better. And you might have seen this slide before, but a lot of it starts with visibility. A lot of hunting is you have tons of logs, tons of data, maybe you have a data lake, a sim, a bunch of tools, whatever, and you're querying, you're searching, you're looking at stuff. Cool. But if you don't have the information, what are you doing? How are you hunting? I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's going to be a lot more retrieving and waiting for things to come back. So if you can collect information, the better. And can you collect the best information? Can you collect things that are already enriched, or can you enrich information before you start using it? What is this IP address? Who is this user? What are the relationships between these people or these events? That's super valuable information. You've got to try to start with that. And then utilize open source and APIs. Hunting isn't necessarily programming, software engineering, but I have to say the best security teams out there that I see are basically all software engineers at this point. They try to automate the crap out of everything, and then they write code for anything new. And a lot of teams do a great job of combining commercial and open source. Some products, maybe it makes way more sense to do the commercial version, but there are some pretty cool open source tools out there. And guess what? Maybe you can prove out your point with an open source tool that doesn't require procurement, because I know that's a pain point. That's a block to hunting sometimes. And just to call out a specific example, one of the coolest things I've, I, I've seen uh, as just a sort of slightly thinking outside the box is, is like honey cards or, or honey credit cards kind of thing, where teams just spend like a thousand bucks on some prepaid credit cards. 
sprinkle those credit card numbers throughout your environment and documents. And then if you ever get a charge on any of those cards, it's a very high signal to noise ratio. You might never get a hit, so you can't just count on that, but very high signal to noise ratio. Those are the kinds of things you can start to deploy without a lot of effort, without a lot of cost. And in thinking about this, you know, my original thought for the talk was, because I wanted to get you riled up, are threat hunting and incident response the same thing? And I still ask myself that, and I still think maybe they are. We hunted bin Laden, but that was really incident response if, if we're InfoSec. They're sort of hunting my tenants in Chicago, but sort of incident response there too. So, um, you know, I don't know. But the point here is, when you start thinking about your pain points, maybe how you can contribute to improving hunting, improving some aspects of maybe incident response, triage. There are different stages. You know, hunting, maybe a little bit more exploratory, you know, and then you, you, you have some discoverable events. And then usually you still have to do some triage before it's a full-blown investigation or, or maybe what people call true incident response. Where are you helping? Where can you provide value? Can you take capabilities from different parts of the spectrum and help and use tools for different things? Can you use a hunting tool for Investigation, probably. Can you use an investigation tool for hunting? Probably. So just be thinking about that. How do I use stuff I already have? People I already have. And then entrepreneurial journey, you have to sell. How many people in the room are salespeople? How many people who didn't raise their hand consider themselves like they sell stuff? Well, I'll give you a spoiler here. When I was teaching my entrepreneurship class, and the class was pretty cool, it was 10 weeks, you come in with nothing, you make teams, and then 10 weeks, it's like Shark Tank. You pitch to a whole panel, and you know, here's my idea, here's my MVP, here's you know, customer feedback, et cetera. It was, it was awesome. I, I really enjoyed that. But I asked one of the teams, what are you selling? And they said, oh, we're not selling anything. I'm like, no, you're always selling. I'm selling you guys right now on these topics, on me, on my company, on everything. Can you sell your company on new spending? Can you sell your organization on freeing up time to hunt? Can you sell the culture on helping you improve efficacy or other aspects of hunting and incident response? For example, if everyone would just listen to music on their phone instead of installing Spotify and everything else on their laptop, you'll have fewer events to look at. The culture can truly make a difference in how easy you can hunt or how effective you can be. So you have to learn how to sell. I'm a huge introvert technical geek guy and I have to do all sorts of stuff and go ask for millions of dollars and things like that. It just helps if you learn how to sell. And then competition. You know, you don't want to completely focus on competition when you're building a product, but if you're a practitioner, your competition is other activities. Everything is grabbing at your time, trying to steal your time. And some of it's waste, like we talked about. So can you look at competition, hunting competition, and figure out ways to create more leverage, involve other people, automate, that kind of thing, so then you free up time. The other thing I want you to do is beat up your vendors. And I'm a multi-vendor time person, so I can say that. When you figure out something that should be done in your environment or something that would make your life easier, build it yourself, but at the same time, concurrently, ask your vendor. Join a customer advisory board. Just provide some feedback. Go to user groups. Whatever it is, it doesn't hurt you to ask. Could they add this one field? Could they output it in JSON instead of syslog? Whatever it is, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Just ask. Ask. As a vendor, we crave feedback. We want to hear what makes your lives easier. So yes, build stuff yourself. The best teams out there are building things themselves, but they also push hard on their vendors. So wrapping up and, and, and ranting even more than I already am. So one of the TED Talks I was watching, I can't remember even which one, 
but the absence of disease does not mean health. And I think that describes InfoSec very well. The absence of APT, or the absence of compromise, or pick your term, does not mean you have a great environment. I think everyone would pretty, pretty quickly agree with that. So when I talked about, hey, I consider hunting not just threat hunting, but like other stuff, other things you can go look for as a human to try to improve things. Can you figure out where your entropy is or where different aspects of risk are? Can you, when you hunt, a successful hunting outcome might not be finding APT or pick your terminology, sophisticated threat actors, or even run-of-the-mill malware. It might be finding misconfigurations or lots of configuration drift, that kind of stuff. And, you know, I was thinking about this and, and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna, you know, we talk about upstream, downstream. I'm gonna make a chart or a graph that says, hey, risk is a slope, and the more risk you have, the steeper the slope, and then your environment is sitting at the top. And it's just kind of sliding down into compromise. So can you lower the slope, decrease the slope? Reduce risk, reduce the slope. And so one thing that's really, really common is something called identity creep, privilege creep, pick your latest buzzword of the year kind of thing. But everyone has access, in this room, everyone has access they don't need, 100%, guaranteed. I would bet a lot of money on that, 100%. We have 30 people. We have people that haven't used AWS for 238 days. Now that's my CEO who's busy doing other stuff. But even we at 30, 30 have accounts we don't need. And then it is hard. I dumped our AWS uh, schema. They have a, a way to dump it, your security settings and policy settings in JSON. 30 people, not doing anything crazy. 20,000 lines of JSON. So it's a hard problem. Figure out who has what permissions, IAM roles, et cetera. But the point is, when you're hunting, you might find some of this stuff. Can you go find accounts that don't need to exist? It's not just about malware. We're gonna get a lot of great talks on reverse engineering and network packets and stuff, that's awesome. Cool, we need to know that stuff. But it's not just about that. Can you right size your surface area? Can you find either, it could be accounts, it doesn't have to be accounts, it could be systems. We've all heard of the server that everyone thought was unplugged and that was the one that got compromised. No one even knew it was still on the network. Can you shrink your surface area, reduce your risk, and guess what? It gives you a more focused area to hunt in. It's like if you shrink the size of a football field and you're playing defense, you're probably gonna have a better time because you don't have to run all over defending the wide receivers and stuff. And look, we're talking about lean, we're trying to do more with less and, and just you know, reduce waste. I talked to a 600 person company. Just in three services, they're wasting 35K a month. They can't hire headcount. The, the CISO has actually just left because he couldn't get any headcount. That's like 400 grand. That's plenty of headcount there. Or at least that's a start, we'll say. So in your hunting, there might be different outcomes. The point of all this is it's not just about things like malware or compromise. Find things that contribute to waste. Find waste. And to rant a little bit more, I think Phil and, and Rob mentioned there are 60, uh, 60 talk submissions. I was on the, I'm on the advisory board for this, so uh, thank you for all the submissions. I, I really enjoyed reading them and voting on which ones I thought could get picked, and, and if you didn't get picked, come, come yell at me or whatever. It wasn't just me, it was a group of like 10 of us or whatever. Probably blame Phil or Rob the most though. Um, but 60 submissions. I think three or four were on cloud. I was blown away. We gotta think more about cloud. Cloud is here. Cloud is here. IT is going from zero to 100 and leaving uh, security in the dust when it comes to cloud. We're blind to all these SaaS accounts. 50% of IR for Rapid7, or at least this team at Rapid7, is Office 365. 50%, that's a lot. And we have 300 AWS accounts and no governance. I'm sure no one has that problem in this room. Uh, and I just like this quote, hackers don't break in, they log in. 
But the point is, I hope next year, we talk a little bit more about cloud. AWS forensics, hunting in Slack, I don't know, pick your, pick your topic, but it's here. It's here. Even the big conservative financial institutions that have been around 100 years are moving. I've talked to the intelligence community. They're like, we want to use Slack, but we don't know how to use it because we're, we can't really monitor it. It's here. We need more talks on cloud. So wrapping up here, where's the waste? Where's the extra risk? Where's the entropy? When you hunt, can you find that kind of stuff? Where can you spend your time when you actually do get time to hunt? Can you find time to do that? Identify what's providing value and focus on that and try to reduce the other time you spend. We all have to experiment and try things, but as soon as you realize this isn't actually increasing our capabilities to hunt, do incident response, overall cyber defense, whatever it is, get rid of it or park it for a bit. Build, measure, learn. I think everyone will remember that. But go build something. Even if it's just tying a couple APIs together. See if that helps you. Write a little bit of Python. Python never killed anybody as far as I know, but maybe I'm wrong. Think big, start small, act fast. Be the hunter that your environment needs. There's a quote from Guy Kawasaki, a legend in Silicon Valley, chief evangelist at Apple. Be an being an entrepreneur is a state of mind, not a job title. And I'm pretty certain I'm not the first person to say this, but I don't know who, who did, so I just put my name there. Being a hunter is a state of mind. It's not a job title. So I told you I like a lot of books. I could give you tons and tons of recommendations. I love these books. I've read them multiple times. Uh, Rocket Men is one I'm reading right now about Apollo 8, which is really exciting. Space race between Russia and the US. Uh, essentialism, team of teams about how, uh, how, how JSOC had to reform themselves to fight Al Qaeda in Iraq. It was just really interesting. Uh, and extreme ownership, all about some, some lessons learned from really high combat areas. Really cool stuff. So the goal, spark contemplation. And I know I threw a lot at you, and some of it you're like, why the hell did we learn about that? Well, keynotes are like that. But Reid Hoffman, founder of LinkedIn, Silicon Valley God, if you're not embarrassed by your first version or your first product, you've shipped too late. The point here is you can take a small step towards better hunting capabilities without a lot. Without a lot. You have some data already. You have some APIs already. You have some skills. Go connect them in the right way. Think about it more like an entrepreneurship. How can I build my case? How can I build my case to get funding, even if that funding is just time? So what can you do today to upgrade your hunting? Thanks.